Welcome back to this uh, uh, continuation of the cloud storage lecture. So as I told you, we have this whole stack, but it's going to take us a few weeks to uh, build it. it. Takes a bit of time, of course. It took years uh, to to um, to build it for the engineers. But today we are starting at the bottom of the stack because we need to store data somewhere. So how do we go from a single machine to a cluster? Um, Data needs to be stored from somewhere. This is along the lines of saying that information is physical, which is uh, something popular in, uh, in physics. In fact, it's uh, one of the realization uh, of the 20th and 21st century that uh, storing and processing information cannot be done outside the laws of physics of our universe. So it needs to be stored somewhere, right? Uh, and when we store data, so when you have a database, it means you store data and you query data, right? Uh, there are two main paradigms that you can uh, that you can approach this with. So make sure that you are aware of these two paradigms. There's the traditional paradigm. This is the one that dates back to the 70s with uh, Edgar Code, uh, where the database system fully manages the storage. So that's the case of PostgreSQL. How do you see that? Because you have no idea how it's stored on the disk, and frankly, you don't care. What happens is that you write SQL to import your data, and you write SQL to query your data, and you write SQL to update your data. PostgreSQL is going to take care of the rest. This is called the ETL approach, extract, transform, load. It's the idea that the database system takes care of everything. Right? You can, if you want, try to open the files, because they are, in the end, stored on your hard drive right? somewhere. But it's going to be not transparent to you and, uh, and uh, very often proprietary, binary, so very hard for you to to, uh, to look at. In fact, only the engineers designing the system would actually know well how the files are structured. But all you see is tables. You are within the data model. That's the traditional way of doing that. There is a second way that's called the data lake approach. The data lake approach is the idea that you literally dump your data on some uh, file system. It can be on your laptop, but it can also be in one of those that we will see now with the cloud storage. And you just read from there. Right. That's the data lake approach. So you no longer have a database system taking care of everything for you. You actually see your files. It's going to be CSV files, XML files, JSON files. You can even open it with a text editor, even though there's also binary formats. This is also called in situ processing, meaning that you just query the data where it is. Right. Why in situ as opposed to there? Is that not in situ? Well, not really. Because if you use this approach right here, there is an extra step. If you want to start querying your data that you just freshly downloaded from the internet, maybe a data set that you want to query, here you must import it. You have to go through the extra step of putting that data inside your database system. That's called an import or an ETL. Here, you don't need that. You just drop in the file system and that's it, right? So this is why it's called in situ. And examples of that, this is typically what people also do when they use a Python or Jupyter notebook with pandas and so on. This is typically in situ processing, right? The data lake approach. Um, of course, you can also use notebooks with PostgreSQL, right? But then this is not in situ because you are actually connecting to PostgreSQL, right? This is not like with pandas. All right. So there's pros and cons on both sides. If you don't know what to do, this is the way to go in large, ma large majority of the cases. Why? Because this is going to be typically much faster. So if you are in a company, you want something enterprise ready and your data is not too messy and rather structured, go for this approach. This here is really for read intensive data analytics at very large scales where you don't want to go through the trouble of importing your data and you just want to start querying it in C2, right? Okay, for whom is that clear, the separation between the two? All right, and we'll cover both in our lecture, right? So this week in the exercises, this is pretty much what you're gonna deal with. But when we study the cloud storage, HDFS, Spark, and so on, we are gonna be in the data lake uh, mode. Okay, so now, no matter what you use, in the end, things are gonna land on a mechanical device like this. So this is a hard drive. You can see the data is stored. In that case, it's magnetic, right? So you, you, you basically have this, uh, this uh, magnetism that you use in order to store the zeros and the ones. This is the, uh, the reading head or writing head. This is how you read the data. And this is rotating because you can only actually write right here, right? So this is where the latency comes from. You need time for this to rotate 
until it lands under the uh, the head right there, right? So now it's rotating quite fast. Nowadays, I think we are far beyond 5,400, 7,200 turns per minute. Is it turns per minute, uh, Wenchi? I think so, right? When we say 7,200, I think it's turns per minute. So this is super fast. Not as fast as, as a neutron star as a black hole, but, uh, but uh, still very, very fast. Okay, what's more, the way that data is stored on a device like that, it still has a level of abstraction. Here you just see zeros and ones, but actually with the, the operating system, Linux, uh, Linux, Mac, I don't know, Linux, Linux, have a, but anyway, uh, Linux, Mac, Windows, and so on, they all organize the disk with a file hierarchy um, abstraction with directories and files. You all know what directories and files are, right? So I don't need to say much, but this is basically the, uh, the way that this is done. In the 1960s, this is how people were dealing with data, right? And uh, then came Edgar Cott who said, no, 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 that must be hidden. And then you get the left-hand side with ETL. But on the right-hand side, you expose it possibly uh, again. Okay, but this is a file hierarchy. Something else that you should know, because this is going to be used in big data as well, is that when you read and write to this thing here, to this disk, you don't read and write one bit at a time. Why don't you do that? Because if you did that, you need at every bit to wait until it rotates. This is going to take until the end of the universe until you manage to write a single file. So you cannot do that. And for this reason, we read and write in blocks. We don't read one bit at a time. We read mostly something like 4,000 bits at a time, right, in blocks. And these 4,000, they are contiguous physically, right? So you just have the head somewhere, then you rotate a little bit and read the next 4,000, and then you didn't, don't need to wait. You just go along the 4,000 bits. So this is why we, we store the content in blocks, and the blocks can be spread all over the disk, but a single block is continuous, right? So the, the order of magnitude is 4K, 4 kilobytes, for a single block in, uh, in many systems, right? Okay. Now, if you want to store it, if you want a data lake stored locally on your machine, maybe for the astronomical sky survey data, uh, you could think of your local machine. You could also think of your local network, maybe some of, who has a hard drive at home that's connecting through a network? Some of you? Some of you, okay, see very sense. So you can, plug your hard drive in that way over the network and share it across machines, right? Are you raising your hand also for this? Or you have a question? Oh, microphone. Yeah, we're gonna, so, almost, wow. Uh, yeah, um, what I would ask is, uh, is the local hard drive also a data lake? So if we uh, try to search for a file there, because it's also structured, also something like this? Yes, you could use the local drive as a data lake. So the data lake is basically, I would call it a level of abstraction above the, uh, the device. Um, you could have a data lake uh, on your local laptop using your hard drive, and you could have a data lake in the cloud as well. If you are in the cloud, you can have a bigger data lake. If you are on your laptop, you can have a smaller data lake. Um, but calling it a data lake on your laptop, is more a matter of perspective than actually doing something because you could say, okay, we have it has been a data lake for 50 years and we just didn't know that it was a data lake, right? So, so uh, it's more of a mindset kind of looking at things. But absolutely, you could consider that uh, your local drive can be used as a data lake or you can do it in the cloud. Both is acceptable. Um, what I more meant is because it's not in a relational table, the whole data is just structured in files and Ah, I see. Okay. So the notion of data lake is independent from the shape. You could have a data lake full, full of CSV files, but you could also have a data lake full of XML and JSON, or you could have a data lake full of uh, cubes or graph data, right? So if I want to be more precise on what a data lake is, it's basically a bunch of directories and files where the files actually contain data, CSV, XML, JSON, and so on. Uh, if, if the files are something else, like the, I don't know, uh, you're playing video games and you save stuff, you wouldn't call it a data lake, even though some researchers view video games as a database problem, but generally you really reserve the same data lake where you have CSV, XML, JSON, so data formats. 
right. Did I answer your question? No. Okay, awesome. Okay, wait, I have to be ready. Oh, there you go. Okay, uh, so you can put this uh, drive with all your CSV, XML, JSON files, um, or it could also be the PostgreSQL files, right? If you're using the ETL approach. Um, on your local network, LAN means local area network, right? So this is when you, when you have it at home. WAN, one, means wide area network. This is like the entire city or even the world. But this doesn't work. You can just not put your hard drive to be used by billions of users. It's going to just break. It's not going to make it, right? So this is the limit of the hard drives. We cannot go beyond your local home uh, and, and, or a small team, but you cannot go beyond that with a, with a hard drive. Uh, the number of files I already told you about, you can have thousands or millions of files uh, on, your, uh, on your local laptop drive, but a, a billion files, no, I, I, I don't think. You could, if you really store uh, very, very super small files, uh, you, you, you might be achieving that, but I don't think it's going to be very usable. In a typical setting, you just don't go that far. It's not meant for that. Uh, so we cannot use that for the uh, SDDS data sets. That doesn't work. But remember what I told you, the way that we solve things with batteries is that we use plenty of batteries. So you can use plenty of drives. So this is where this is all going. So what we're gonna do on the logical level, now we forget about the, 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 the hardware, we throw away the notion of any hierarchy for today's lecture for cloud storage. So we don't have files, we don't have directories. We make the data model actually trivial, as simple as possible. So what is our model now? You see model, it's again a model, not the relational model, but file storage model. We just decide that our model consists of a bunch of files and each file is identified with an ID, an identifier, right? It's that simple. That's called the key value model, right? We have a key, the ID that is mapped to a value that is the file. We, we will also call it object. So object is typically the term that we use in the context of uh, cloud storage, but it's really synonymous for file because in the end, what you put as an object is going to be JSON, XML, CSV, and so on. All right, so we, we throw away the hierarchy and instead replace it with a super simple model, the key value model that is mapping uh, IDs to files, right? So what does it mean? You have a global key value model, it's flat, right? Just a, a huge number of files like that, millions of, of files. And the way it works is with get and put. You can say, put this file there with this ID, and you can come back later and say, give me the file that has this ID, right? This is our model, super simple. No hierarchy, no directories, flat. And then we're going to try to make this scale. And in fact, one of the, the intuitions I would like to communicate to you during this lecture is that with this kind of simplification, of oversimplification, we make it much easier to take it to petabytes and to billions of things, right? So simplicity helps a lot here. Uh, so how, what do you do next, right? So now we have our model. Now it's ready for scaling, right? How do you, do, how do you scale? So the first idea that you might have could be uh, if you're reaching the limits of your laptop, Maybe you don't have enough space on your uh, drive. Maybe you don't have enough working memory. Maybe you don't have enough CPU cores. So what do you do? You can buy a more expensive machine, right? Just buy an another machine with double the amount of, uh, of memory and double the drive space. Still not enough, just buy an even bigger machine, right? That's called scaling up, right? Scaling up, scaling down would be the opposite. When you buy less, scaling up means, uh, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger machines. Um, approach two, that's different. It's another approach. Instead of buying bigger machines, you buy more machines, but you keep them small. You just buy plenty of machines, a lot of machines that are just small. In fact, I already we already discussed that in a data center, this is the approach. This is called scaling out, right? Scaling up, bigger machines, scaling out, more machines. The opposite of scaling out is scaling in. Scaling out, scaling in. Scaling down, scaling up, right? So scale up, down, out, in. These are the, the four prefixes. So we scale out. 
in fact, you probably figured out that scaling out makes more economical sense than scaling up. It's actually pretty easy to figure out because if you have a terabyte disk and you want two terabytes, that's fine. Just purchase a two terabyte drive. Four, okay, going to be more expensive. You can buy a four terabyte drive. Eight, 16, yes, that's fine. 32, hmm, doesn't exist. Might take two years. You might need to own a company like Seagate or Western Digital to do the research for that. That's going to cost a lot of money, right? Now, if you want a petabyte hard drive, that's probably going to cost you trillions of dollars. And maybe even with that, you will not manage to build one before maybe 2050. So you can see how scaling up is actually exponential, perhaps even more than exponential, right? It might even be hyperbolic that you hit a wall. So scaling up is basically not viable uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of economies of scale. Scaling out is more viable because buying one more machine is the same price. Buying even more machines is the same price. Of course, economists will argue that past a certain point, if you start having so many machines, then you start pushing the price up, right? This is microeconomics. But if you consider that you're a, a, a smaller company and you just buy 10 or 100 or 1,000 machines, maybe 10,000, that's fine. You might not influence the prices too much. And then it's, uh, it's linear, right? It's only for companies like uh, uh, Google, Apple, Meta, and so on. Maybe for, for them, scaling out might be uh, 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 a bit more polynomial or exponential. But for the rest of us, uh, it's going to be just a line, right? Just a multiplication, the price of one machine multiplied by the number of machines. For whom does that make sense? That scaling out makes sense? Okay. And there is a third approach that is actually super important, is that you can, you can also decide to not scale up, to not scale out, to just do with the machine you have by just being smart. What does it mean? You try to optimize the way you store your data. Maybe you can compress it. Maybe you can remove duplicate data and then fit more on the same drive. And you can write better code, right? You can improve your code so that instead of taking 10 seconds, it's taking one second. This is so important. You wouldn't imagine these laptops right here. You wouldn't imagine what they are capable of doing, what you can squeeze in there, what you, you can squeeze out of these laptops in terms of power. In fact, in many use cases, even in big data, your laptop will be enough. So I hope that in this lecture, I will manage to make you love your laptop for the capabilities that it has, right? That's the goal. It's amazing what you can do. And many people make the mistake of thinking, okay, we need the cloud. It's a buzzword, it's fancy. We can brag that we're using the cloud. But what happens is that you're throwing money at machines in the cloud. It's too slow and you're blindly throwing even more money, hoping it's going to be faster. It doesn't work. This works in 80% of the cases. You create a startup for querying data. A lot of these startups will have enough with a single machine just by optimizing the way they store things on the machine. So this is super important, right? And I like this quote about that. You can have a second computer, so a data center. Once you've shown, you know how to use the first one. Right. And in fact, what data scientists love to do, of course, we love to work with data centers and computers and so on. But when you, when you build a database engine like RumbleDB that we'll be using in this lecture, it works on the cloud. We made it work with, uh, with uh, uh, dozens of machines uh, in the cloud with Amazon and Azure. But when we developed RumbleDB to make it faster, we did it on a laptop. I did it on my laptop, took as much as I could from my laptop. And then you take it to the cloud, it's also going to be faster in the cloud, but you're basically squeezing more out of the, of the same hardware. All right. In this lecture, we will focus mostly on scaling out technologically, but this is after I give you this warning, right? That you also need to be careful. I'll give you a few hints probably also along the way on how to, uh, how to squeeze more out of, uh, of your hardware. All right. Which brings us, and again, I, I'm repeating myself, but I love to repeat things because this is, this is how one learns. Let's go back to the data centers. So we saw that in a data center, we have a lot of machines, thousands of machines, tens of thousands of machines. Uh, I put the interval in there, a thousand to a hundred thousand of machines. There is a limit, in fact, and this limit doesn't have economical reasons, it has physical reasons, is that when you start having 10,000 machines, tens of thousands of machines at the same place, first, you're consuming as much electricity as in an airport. Seriously, 
This is, you are at the, at the level of an airport. You need to consume all that electricity. You have all this optic fiber coming from your provider and you need to cool everything down. Massive amounts of energy to cool everything down, right? And you reject heat and so on. So this is basically what blocks you from having more. Of course, we can do it smartly. In some places, we use the heat generating by data centers to warm up the homes in the neighborhood, right? We can, we can recycle all, all of that heat and all that energy dissipated uh, to, uh, to, for heating, right? But physically, we are at these limits that it's very hard to go past 100,000. Now, it's very hard to know in real life what the maximum number is for companies because they don't always communicate about it, so they, they keep it secret, so we don't really know. But from what is public, this is more or less the estimate of, of what we think that's the higher limit in the data center. What do you do when you reach the limit? You just build more data centers, right? You just start more locations. So this is why the companies have many data centers all across the world uh, when they can afford it. All right. Um, then on one machine, that's also called a node. That's a synonym for machine. So you might hear me say node, meaning machine. Uh, it has between one and 200 cores on each server. Uh, the way that they are exposed to the users is virtually, these are actually virtual machines that simulate machines. It's not directly the cores of the hardware. So this is why you might hear virtual cores. And in fact, the number of virtual cores is double the number of cores that you have physically on the machine. This is because of a technology called hyper-threading by, by the, 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 the CPU makers that allows you to, to double what you get out of a core, right? So this is a virtual core uh, is doing that. All right, but between that, the order of magnitude between one and 200, typically it's powers of two or multiples of powers of two, 64, 128, and so on. That's the kind of numbers that, uh, that you will see, right? These numbers are getting up every year. Maybe not the number of machines, because I, I, I said this physically is a bit of a hard limit, but the number of cores per machine is actually rising every year. The size of the hard drive is rising too. I, I put 30 terabytes, this year, we will achieve it. Now, it's still 26, but 30 is coming soon, right? That's the local storage per server. Because yes, in a data center, we still have these drives there. We can have SSDs, but we still have also these mechanical drives because they are actually fast, uh, they are cheaper, sorry. They are cheaper than the flash drives, SSDs. So we still have a lot of these for data. And the RAM, uh, 16 gigabytes is probably what you have on your laptop. Some of you might have 32, maybe 64. In a data center, we can actually put more. So we might have memory intensive and we can go all the way to six terabytes of memory. I really mean not the hard drive, but the working memory, the one that when you switch off electricity, it goes away, right? So the working memory. So this is the order of magnitude. So I said plenty of small, cheap machines, but they can be a bit larger than your laptop, right? You can still push a little bit what you have on the machine, but we have plenty of these machines. Network bandwidth shouldn't surprise you. Now we even have that, that at home gigabits per second, uh, 10 gigabit per second, I think is now even available. Uh, you can typically go even all the way to uh, 100 gigabits per second, maybe even more today. We'll see later, we'll come back to that, why network is so important because the machines communicate with each other, but we'll look at how, we'll take time in the next few weeks to, to look at that. Now, plenty of cheap machines like your laptop? Well, not exactly. If you picture the data center as a big room with 10,000 laptops, that's not how it looks like. Rather than a laptop, uh, this is what it looks like, single machine. Uh, why? Because it's easier to pack them into a room in that way, right? So we just have these, uh, these uh, cuboids, I think is, is the term. So we have these cuboids that are very flat. Uh, it's all standardized because the goal is to have plenty of them. So it's all standardized in terms of what is called a rack unit. RU means rack unit. And all, the, all, the, all, all of them are standardized in that way in a multiple of rack units. I don't know by heart what, what is a rack unit. It may be, I don't know, one or two centimeters, maybe three, uh, something along this order of magnitude, right? Why? Because we actually pile them up in towers. Right, so we, we just put them on top of each other and now we have what is called a rack. This is why it's called the rack unit. So a node is a single one of these things. Sorry, what am I doing the other opposite direction? This is a single node and this is a whole tower called a rack of node. And in a data center, you have plenty of towers 
each tower containing a pile of racks, right? Now you know, this is what there is in a data center. In fact, a few years ago, we even had a field trip with the class to a data center in Zurich. So around Zurich, this so-called uh, internet highway, where you have all the internet network, and then there's a few data centers. Many would think this is in the bunkers under the mountains, like you know the story goes, but in fact, there's a lot of data centers right here around Zurich uh, um, connected to each other, right? And th this has increased in the past few years with more and more offering Switzerland as a location, right? But this is what there is in a data center. It's basically a room like this, exactly, with towers of uh, machines piled up on top of each other. Of course, you don't have only machines. You might also have some of these things that are just made of plenty of disks. Some of them are just network switches. You know, you have plenty of things that you can pile up, but most of them are actually going to be machines like that, right? And inside, you might see the ventilators in there and maybe the CPU, the memory, but uh, this, is, uh, this is what it is. You can even look at it if you go to some uh, online shop, like I don't know, in Switzerland, uh, Digitech, you, you will actually find some of them. You can even look at the specifications if you, if you want. Okay, so this is what there is in a data center. Now I, I've told you, so you know. Uh, this is the hardware level. This is the, the physical level of how it looks like. But of course, once we have a data center with all these towers piling up machines, we need to start using it. So the way that this is done is that uh, there's companies like Interaction and others that are a bit like hotels for computers, right? They, they will give you the uh, rooms with military grade security, but the room is empty. And then you bring your machines. So people get keys and all kinds of way to get in. And then the, the customers are going to put their machines in there. Who are the customers of these uh, hotels or computers? Well, it's mostly going to be the big cloud providers, Amazon, Azure, uh, Google, and so on, who, who have them in there. They also have their own data centers, right? But they might also rent space from these hotel, uh, co computer hotel companies. Uh, and there might also be big companies who can afford it, right? So the, the bigger companies might also directly put their own machines in there without going through Amazon, uh, uh, Azure, or uh, Google Cloud, right? Okay, so now that I demystified it, let's go into Amazon. And then, I mean, now it's a bit known, but back then there was a reaction when I, I was starting to tell about Amazon S3 for cloud storage. And the reaction was, what is Amazon doing there? They're selling books. So what, what is Amazon doing with cloud storage? Well, the thing is, what happened is that Amazon, like any online shop selling books, had the problem that at some times in the year, especially around Christmas, you have a peak of visits and everybody's ordering at the same time. So what do you do? You buy more machines, you scale out, right? So then you buy machines, but the rest of the year, what do you do? You just have these machines standing idle in the basement, the data center. So what Amazon did, and they were the first doing that, is they thought we should actually rent these unused machines to other people who might need them. And this is how Amazon Web Services was created. It's a full subsidiary of Amazon specialized in renting computer power to other people. And then Azure and Google Cloud followed. So now we have several providers and uh, ma many others uh, who, uh, who do that. S3 is one of the many services offered by Amazon Web Services. So of course, you can also directly uh, rent a machine that you connect to via the command line, but it also had storage. And S3 uh, is the uh, cloud storage offering of Amazon. Here's the model. It shouldn't surprise you after I explain to you this global key value model. S3 is based on so-called buckets. A bucket is just part of the abstraction, like a table, a row, a column. So we have buckets. Inside the bucket, so you can identify a bucket, not surprisingly, with a bucket ID, a bucket identifier. And when you look at one bucket and you look what's inside, we have objects and an object ID identifies an object. So if I give you a bucket ID plus an object ID, then you can go ahead and request the object. What is an object? It's just a file. Could be a CSV file, an XML file, could be a video. Actually, there's a lot of videos in there. It's used by uh, Netflix, Disney Plus, and so on. They, they have a lot of their files stored with this technology right here. And so each object is just going to be the fragment of a movie that people stream. 
uh, and when you actually connect to the uh, to the uh, to the service in order to stream your favorite series at home you are actually connecting to s3 or the equivalent from competitors and this is where your movies come from right to your tv or to your machine so this was in fact the first use case of this storage was to store uh, pictures and videos and especially from streaming services right so the streaming services will not build their own data centers at least not immediately but they will rent uh, through these services in order to store the, the movies all right so bucket id plus object id gives us an object and then you can get and put your objects in this way it's very simple right it, it's really as simple as that um, there is a maximum size that is allowed in there it's five terabytes could change in the future but right now it's five terabytes it's hard to know why because they don't communicate on how they actually are doing that it's a bit of a black box um, and uh, the fact the fact that there is a limit of five terabytes you could infer that it fits on a machine so maybe this is done in a way that each object is, is uh, fitting on a machine right but we don't know much about that However, you can read papers from the competitors like Azure Blob Storage, and you can assume that probably the ideas are a bit similar because for Azure, they actually openly communicated about how they are doing cloud storage. All right. Another limit is that you can have a hundred such buckets per account, but if you write them a nice email and formulate your request kindly, uh, and uh, they will probably allow you to have more. But if you want more, you need to be sure that you want more because maybe you, you're doing it wrong maybe instead you need to put more objects uh, in each bucket right but this is a limit here to give you an idea uh, now here comes the uh, legalese part with all the lawyers um, when you are a large company and you rent services like imagine you're netflix and you're renting from amazon s3 to store your uh, your your movies you want guarantees because what happens if Amazon just shuts down that doesn't work and then your customers cannot watch their favorite series, right? So you need guarantees. So for this, you sign contracts and the contracts are going to guarantee to Netflix that Amazon can uh, deliver, in that case, durability. What does it mean? It means that if you store uh, 10 to the power of 11 is 100 billion objects. So if you store 100 billion objects, one of them is going to be lost in the coming year that's what it means that's not a lot right you really need a lot of objects to see a loss right but there is a loss it's not perfect right so there is a loss of one in 10 to the power of 11 and the lawyers they love to write it with nines so 99.9999999999 percent of durability and this is what you write in the contract that you sign and you get a guarantee for that you also get guarantees on availability meaning that 99.99 percent of the time the systems are up that means one hour per year, it might be down. Uh, and so, yes, we love nines. Uh, this is just for your own reference, but you can actually calculate it yourself if you want. You just take that out of a year. 99% means four days a year, the machines are down. Probably not acceptable from a streaming service. But look, if you add more nines in there, 99.999995 of them percent, four seconds per year. Of course, it's more expensive, right? But it's a pretty good guarantee that four seconds per year only uh, the system is going to be down you can also have these nines in another context the context of latency the response time so the way this is formulated in the contract is not in terms of an average but in terms of most of the time so what is basically written in the contract is that we guarantee you a response time less than 10 milliseconds which is actually quite good in 99.9 .9 percent of the cases Maybe once in a thousand, you might have something smaller, slower than that. But in 99.9% in .9 of the cases, this is going to be less than milliseconds to get your object from S3, right? That's an example. All right, so you see plenty of nines to guarantee many things. This is just the lawyer thing, right? Um, okay, for whom is that clear? All right, and of course, it's up to the engineers to design the system to make these guarantees, right? But all right. There's the, the jokes that some of these companies have more lawyers and salespeople than actual engineers. Uh, but that's another story. All right. So now I told you we are dropping ACID, right? This ACID thing about the transactions, atomicity, consistency, isolation, duration. But the question is, what do we replace it with? And what we replace it with is with the CAP theorem, which is a paradigm that is 
every week we are actually going to see because for every piece of technology, you can ask yourself, how does it fit with the CAP theorem? The CAP, the CAP theorem is an impossibility triangle. It tells you that among three things, you can only have two, right? There's plenty of other, other such impossibility triangles in life, but this is one of them. So what are the three, the three um, um, vertices of this triangle? Well, here they are. Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. These are the three, C, A, P. Just beware that the C here is not the same C as in ACID. It's a different kind of consistency, but let me explain. Consistency here, also called atomic consistency, means that all nodes see the same data. Well, don't forget we're in the cloud, right? So we, we might have a thousand machines in our system. So we can have a thousand machines for S3, probably millions in the case of S3. Consistency tells you that all of the nodes see the same data. So you can ask any node for the object you're looking for. You can ask this one, you can ask that one. They will all give you the same answer. If this is true, then you're saying that your system is consistent, C. Another one, that's A, that's the second vertex of the triangle. This is availability. It's telling you that you can query the database at all times. You, you can come anytime, you can stream your favorite series on your laptop. This is availability. Right. And then consistency, the, oh, no, no, this is an explanation. Uh, I don't have a slide. Let me explain the third one. I think I don't have a slide for partition tolerance. So let me explain partition tolerance, then I'll go to the animation. It's an animation to explain why you can't have all three. Partition tolerance means that if for some reason the system uh, the, the network is cut, and that can happen because, for example, of uh, uh, catastrophes, natural catastrophes, you might be disconnected. For example, the, the Atlantic Ocean uh, suddenly might be, the, 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 the cables might be unavailable. Then you have what's called a partition of the network. You basically are left with several pieces of the network of the internet that are no longer communicating with each other. This is called a partition. Partition tolerance means that if you have such a partition because of an earthquake or a tsunami or something, the system is going to not break. It's going to continue to work fine without breaking and collapsing. This is called partition tolerance. What the CAP theorem tells you is that if you want to be partition tolerance and be resistance, if there is a natural catastrophe, then you have to choose between being available or consistent, but you cannot have both. So either you are going to be available but then you have to accept that asking at different places, you get different answers, right? Some people do it that way. Or you can say, no, 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 I want to be consistent, but we might be temporarily unavailable. So you just get this fancy message like currently unavailable, but as soon as the partition is fixed then it starts working again. So you have to choose between either availability or consistency. Why is that? I'm going to try to give you an intuition of that before we stop for today. Imagine we have this network. What is this? Every node here is a machine. It's, a, it's one of the machines in the data center, but let's say across multiple data centers even. They could be in the same one or in different ones. The lines between them, this is the network. They communicate with each other and they can sense data. On each one of these nodes, you can have data stored, right? Um, in some cases, all of the data is on every node, but in some cases, the nodes have partial views of the data, right? Depends on your system. Uh, in the case of the Bitcoin blockchain, you have the entire data on each machine, but in some other systems, you don't. That's called sharding, right? Ethereum sharding, you might have heard, but we'll talk about sharding in this lecture as well. But anyway, you have the data in there. Now, imagine that a user connects, sorry, connects to that node and they do what's called a put. So they put an object in there to that node. They communicate with this one. What's gonna happen next in a working system is that it's going to be replicated and shipped over by the system, by Amazon S3, to other nodes who make a copy of that. This propagates throughout the network. If there's no problem, it will propagate through the entire network. Then everybody will see the same data eventually. However, if, 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 if you have an update and something happens that partitions the network, then if you, want to be consistent, then you have to wait. Because you might have time to 
copy and propagate through that part of the network. But these nodes here, they don't have yet a copy. So now you're faced with a conundrum. Either you say, because I want consistency, I'm stopping temporarily the whole system waiting for this to resolve. So I'm unavailable. I drop the A, I'm P and C. Or you say, I want to remain available. So these nodes continue to serve customers. These nodes continue to serve customers. However, they might not return the same answer. This will return the latest version. This might return an earlier version. Then you drop the C. You are P and A. Right? And the third one is A and C, where you drop P, then you're not partition tolerant. Right? You're available and uh, consistent, but if there is a catastrophe, then that's it. It's just, uh, it's just the, the system uh, doesn't work anymore. So this is the intuition for the CAP theorem. A very good question to ask yourself, every technology we'll see, ask yourself, which one of the three don't we have? Is the system PC, AC, or uh, AP? Right, it's a good question to ask yourself. Do not believe the marketing people who tell you we are all three. They're lying, that doesn't work. You cannot be all three, right? But you will hear that a lot, that uh, people claim to be all three. Okay, now, before I leave you, no, there you go. Is it loading the page? Yes. So before you go, just testing, this is a way for me, especially at the beginning of the semester to calibrate things. I want to make sure that I can accelerate, I can slow down, um, but in order to do that, I need to see if you're following, if you're still there, or if you're completely lost. So this is why I have this question to get a feeling of the room. And here it's good because this is what I typically like to see that most of you, or no, of course that doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, most of you uh, are in the 80 to 99% uh, parts, uh, which is good. So it means the speed is, is totally okay. If you understand everything, that's absolutely great. Maybe you can read more of the optional readings uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, learn more. If you understand less, that's absolutely okay too, because we have exercises, we have the Moodle forum. So we are here to explain and make sure you understand. Maybe it will also become clearer after you read, right? Because there's this note, this uh, textbook now that you have. And if you read the textbook, then maybe some of the things will be explained better, right? Uh, and also less than half, don't worry. Ask questions to your, to your uh, friends, ask questions to us on the Moodle forum. Uh, we, are, we are here for you. So thank you very much, everybody. It's exactly uh, 10 o'clock. Enjoy the exercise session this week about SQL. Please do the SQL notebooks. It's a, it's a great exercise to do. And I'll see you next week at uh, 8 a.m. same day. Thank you very much, everybody.